So this is spring of 2021. I was like, I'm not showing up to none of my college classes anymore. I'm signed up for my real estate university class. And it just kind of ran from there. And that's how I got into real estate. All right, here we go. This is the Living Numbers Podcast, where everyone is interesting if you ask the right questions. I want to just say thank you all for listening. Thank you for subscribing, sharing, downloading. This is not your first rodeo. Make sure y'all cop some merch. I got the links in the description. Make sure you do all of that stuff. And now that we've paid the bills. Okay, this guy that I have here is a freaking rock star, and I can't wait to get into our conversation, but y'all know how we do. Whenever I have somebody on for the first time, they have to get an elaborate intro. So, (laughs) hailing from Stanford, Connecticut, this reminds me of The Office. I don't know if you watched The Office, we could talk about it in a second, but they had a Stanford branch, and that branch, that's that's a whole nother tangent, but... This guy's from Stanford, Connecticut. He did attend the prestigious UConn University, where he represented the business connections learning community in various capacities. He is now a full-time licensed and certified realtor that may have changed recently, which we'll talk about, but he is also the founder and host of the Walk to Wealth podcast and social media mastermind. Lover of cats, Jersey club music, and has the self-proclaimed best hair in real estate. Enthusiastic, unconventional enterpriser. I present the John Mendez. Say hello to the people. (laughs) Thank you so much for the introduction. That's probably the best intro I ever got, honestly. Well, 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 well thought out. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. And uh, uh, for your listeners. And then I, I got some heat to drop. So, you know, make sure to tune in, stick in, stick it out for the whole episode. Man, the intro is one of my favorite things to do. And it takes a little bit of time, depending on like what people have on the internet. What do I hear from other podcasts? But I feel like when I get it done, I'm like, okay, they're going to like this. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to kick it off with our first number. And that is $90 because for me, and I know this number it has to be different for you. It costs me about 90 bucks every three months to either pay for my hair products or get my hair redone. So we got to yeah. start with the hair. You don't have it out right now, but yeah. you guys have to check out this guy's hair. It is amazing. He definitely has the best hair on this podcast. I'm not even going <laughs> to uh, But how much money do you spend in your, on your hair? <laughs> so honestly, right, if we're talking just hair products, Right. Products, whatever you need to get done. So I get a haircut like once every month ish. So that's right there. That's 35 right there. So that's 35. Then uh, from there, I, I sometimes I braid my hair. That's about another 30 bucks. I don't braid it every month, but you can add that. And then products. So I'm a big fan of Shea Moisture. Recently, I've been using, thank God it's natural, TGIN. Um, with all you know, the, the conditioner, the leave-in, the deep conditioner, the curling hand smoothie, the you know all that <laughs> stuff. I would say easily, and it was more when I was testing out stuff. When I was testing out stuff, mm. oh my goodness, it takes forever to find something that your hair likes uh, and works with your hair. And so I was spending a lot of money, but I'd say probably now, like I have to refill maybe like I don't know every like three months or so. And like conditioner, it's like I, I try to buy the big packet, like the 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 big. Case it so that's like yeah, the family each. size joint, yeah, yeah, the family size. So that's a shampoo conditioner that's like 15 each, and then deep, uh, deep conditioner, another like 10, 15, and then uh, let's see, my curling hand smoothie that's like another 10, 15, and then coconut oil, a whole oil, it's a whole lot. That's like another, like I buy like the the big Costco coconut oil, so that's like 20 bucks, but I drink it's like a giant tub, so I don't have to buy that. I, I yeah. buy one of those, and that lasts me forever. Um, so I don't know. I'd say easily upwards of a hundred dollars when it's time to refill. Man, I my wife has a lot of hair and she's natural. Yeah. So 
She's had to go through all of these different iterations of what do I use? What's good? What's working? And now, like, what can I find? Just because of the climate that we're in right now, you may have something that you like, but you can't even find it just because of things being on back order or out of stock and we can't get it. So you kind of got to find like a substitute until your real stuff can come in. So I don't personally have to go through all of that. I got <laughs> a few things that I found that I use. Yeah. And I got a great loctician, Tashe, shout out. Um, so I know that she has had to do a lot of that stuff. So I had to ask, and I know that she will appreciate this part of the podcast because she does <laughs> listen. So I'm like, man, I got to talk about this guy's hair first. I was hoping that you would have it out. But um, it, whenever you guys get a chance, and we'll plug the social media and all that stuff here uh, later on in the episode, but this guy's hair is amazing. So <laughs> Speaking of hair, kind of something that may tie into that, I would say when and how, and was your hair a part of this, kind of you yeah. developing your confidence and your style and how you go about things? Because I saw some pictures of you yeah. in high school. And yeah. It was pretty fresh. I'm not going to lie. So I, I when did that, that start brother. to develop? So I'd say, uh, I'll take you back a little bit. I don't know. I can't put my finger on the memory, but I, I always remember... And we talked about this, you know, before we really started getting into the conversation about how down south, a lot of people always say, hey, my grandpa was one of those guys. Uh, but the only difference is my grandpa speaks not a lick of English. So he he would say a lot of people walking down and growing up, we ain't, we ain't have a car. So we walked everywhere. Right. So mm -hmm. he would always say hi to people. And he has a big, you know, Dominican typical beer belly. And but you know, the, the swag, the, the, the confidence, the way he, he just... Walk into a room, you you know my grandpa was him back in his mm -hmm. day. Like you could just tell, and like just me growing up seeing that, it, it definitely played a role into me in, in terms of you know just posture, just sitting up straight, you know walking tall, shoulders down, you know chest up a little bit, chin up, you know, and uh, looking people in the eye, things like that. I I, I seen from him because as I said, you know he he's doesn't speak any English. A lot of times, like people that you know immigrated here that have an accent or don't speak English, I tend to be a little bit uh, a little more timid. And, and you know, um, but he was wasn't like that at all, and so that kind of is what was instilled in me early on, as early as I can remember. But then, um, I'd say I still remember I used to get a, a two on the top, one on the side for my haircut. I don't know what that was, but I didn't know anything about hair, and I still remember like it was yesterday. Um, that my boy uh, Roberto, he was like, "Yo, bro, this is in eighth grade. Next time you get a haircut, ask for a taper." I'm like, what is a taper? He was like, bro, it's like this fade that I got. And his, his, his lineup was tough. His haircut was tough. It was fresh. And so I was like, okay. So that, that I forget if it was that next time or a couple times after that, when I went to go get a haircut, I finally asked like, hey, look, can I get a taper? And it gave me a taper. And back then I was rocking a, a short fro. I didn't know my hair was curly at that time. But I remember I stayed up the night mm -hmm. a little bit extra, made sure I picked my hair out super fresh, super round, perfectly picked out fro. I went to bed. Woke up with bad head, so I spent you know another like twenty minutes or so, uh, <laughs> and I I, put, I picked out my my outfit. You know, I had this red Abercrombie you know uh, collared shirt. I had some black skinny cargos on, and my my bulls over Broadway tens. I still remember the fit like I was yesterday. And then I was walking to school. It was a little rainy. I put my hood on, got to school right, and my hair got a little bit wet because of the, the drizzle. And I had my hood on, and that's when I figured out my hair was curly, because when I got to school, mm. my hair was a little wet. And I had the hood on, it was pressing down. So like, it was like a little wavy. And I honestly, I, I didn't know what that was. I hated it at the time, but I walked in the homeroom first wow. couple steps. And my, it was my friend at the time, Justin, this girl named Nia, I remember, and this guy named Bryson. I walked in the door, it's just like, damn, John. And I was like, and that, for that whole day, I was, I was on top of the world, right? And was the then man. I, I was the man for that day. First time getting a taper. I was like, I was like a new person. I walked in, it was different. And, uh, from there, that's kind of where the confidence started a little bit to really get it um, to get going. And then as I got to high school, um, you know, I, I always had the most hair. At least my freshman year, I did. And then, but, but I always had acne. But I honestly didn't really care. And I, I had a lot of attention just because my hair, I had the biggest row. Me and my, my boy Roberto, we, we both had the biggest row. Sophomore year, I, I cut it, got waves. Waves were spinning. So I was like, okay. And that's when I started figuring out uh, about curly hair products and stuff like that, because with waves it takes a lot, a lot of maintenance, mm -hmm. a lot of brushing, and you have to get your products down. So that was started um, me learning about hair, and then I decided to grow it out again. And this time around, like while I was growing out, um, 
now I know about hair products and I started to really actually, you know, appreciate my hair. And then as I got mm -hmm. a little bit older, junior, senior year start, I feel like junior, senior year, that's when I entered like my, 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 my pretty boy phase, I like to call it. Uh, and that's when I, I hit my growth spurt. I was a midget. So like almost like into like ninth <laughs> grade, so, you know, senior year, that's when my growth spurt kicked in. And I started building up my frame a little bit because football. And so it's like, that's when it all started to come together. And so like, by the time senior year came around, I got my ears pierced. You know, I started doing the eyebrow slits. I was getting my hair done all the time. Like I was, I, I, I feel like that's when I, I, my confidence, like really, really, I mean, it was always pretty high just because like I said, my grandpa stood in, in me early on, but like, yeah, he wasn't telling me anything in high school. Like I, like I, I felt like the man. And then once I got into college though, I, that's when I learned about like more stuff for like, you know, manicures, pedicures, things that, you know, like typical masculine mm -hmm. man or like, oh, that's too good. Like, no, that's just taking care of yourself. Right. So that's in college then. So that's when I like, I, I really started taking great care of myself and it just, you know, it all just, just played out. And by the time I got to that, that point, my acne had gone away. And so it's, that's what really kind of all came together. You mentioned your grandfather and he must have been like so dope because he has such a great <laughs> influence on you. My question is also how much of did your Hispanic heritage play a role in like, I don't know how you saw yourself, how you behaved, you know, how you act, because you also speak fluent Spanish. So yeah. how did that, that side of who you are, uh, you said your people are from Dominica. <laughs> so how did that side kind of uh, yeah, add so, into who you are? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So like the, the Dominican side, so I'm half Dominican, half Guap from my dad's side. My mom's side of the family raised me. So I was raised in a traditional Dominican household. And as I said, like it's something about Dominicans. You just got a certain flow to us. A lot of us It's like, I don't know how to describe it. Like this little swagger, this little charisma. Uh, that, so I guess that was kind of like, I don't know. I, I guess you could say genetic. That's just because like, uh, that, that's what all like the men for the most part in my, in my family were. And, um, and it's funny too, because although I could speak fluent Spanish, my Spanish never didn't really get good until high school, late, late high school when I went to DR mm. for the first time after I graduated. And then it, that's when it started in, improving. Um, I could always hold a little small talk, but once I went to DR, that's when it improved again. And I was always at friends' houses. I was always playing sports after school at church, whatever. So I wasn't really in the house that, that much, but I would say it definitely played a role in terms of like, you know, just my charisma, my energy, the speed at which I talk. I feel like I talk, I have to slow down a lot when I come to these podcasts and yeah, you do be talk conscious. Fast. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, uh, I, I talk very, especially when I get a little emotional or like uh, energetic and I feel like passionate about what I'm talking about. It, it, I have to tell myself to slow down a little bit. And so mm -hmm. it definitely played a lot, uh, a big role in terms of, you know, just the, the, the way I carry myself more so like the, the energy and, you know, the, the flow in terms of like style and everything. I'd say I, I don't really know if I had much of a thought. So I, I grew up in the project. All my friends were black growing up. So it's like uh, the black culture definitely had a big, you know, part of that. All my, mm. my all my boys is, are black growing up. Uh, still to this day, I still have the same boys that I went to elementary school and middle school with. Um, so a majority of pretty much everyone I know was always black. So the black community probably played as much of a, ro a role, if not a, maybe a slightly bigger role in my life than my Dominican role, my side of the family, just because, as I said, I wasn't really in the house. I was always at somewhere and stuff like that. And so... um. I, those two com you know, communities definitely played a, a big part of who I am today. Now we're going to move to another part of high school. And you mentioned it a little bit, yeah. sports. You played yeah. football. I believe you was a cornerback. So I was a safety. I started off at cornerback, though. Um, my eighth okay. grade year, that was my first year playing. But then I, I, I played quarterback as well on the offensive side of things. And then sophomore year, um, ended up not being pretty much told not to play quarterback anymore. So I had to find a new position <laughs> and I made my way to finding myself at, at safety and I, I played wide receiver as well. How much did that play a role, I guess, in kind of your upbringing and then like the mental side? Because I've seen yeah. like through your your history, like you have some leadership experience. You talked about yeah. you putting on this conference, which you can talk about uh, soon, but you, you always kind of found yourself being a leader. So was Mm -hmm. football a way that got you into that were you a leader on the team like a captain or yeah. have you always been a leader like growing up you know around your boys was you the person that people listen to so actually i'd say in terms of growing up you know i was someone that's always very 
vocal, very energetic, very happy, very. But I, I wouldn't say I was like a, a leader, so I wasn't the, the cool guy. And until probably later on uh, in my high school journey, but football, I say the biggest part where it helped me develop, and it helped me develop in a lot of different ways. But the biggest part is definitely um, emotionally, which is a part that most people don't mm-hmm. talk about. But I, I feel like on that football field. Like that's what taught me how to love essentially a little bit. Cause it's like, I know there's just so much raw emotion, so much passion, so much, you know, so much just like, you're just in the moment, right? When you play a football game, you put your helmet on, they kick the ball with that opening kickoff and you know, you hear pads yeah. crunching, you go. right? It's, it's goats. I mean, it's like my mind just blacks. I, I can't remember anything. It's just like, I'm in the zone and like football really taught me how to, you know, how to be angry how to be sad after lo- losing, how to be happy, how to be, you know, it taught me so many different things and how to be vulnerable as well. Cause with football, you know, in high school, maybe you can get away with it. If you have like some kid that's like a stud, but like for the most part, it's like, if those 10, you know, brothers are not, you know, standing next to you on the field, don't know what they got, like their, their position and what they have to do, like best of luck, man, best of luck. So it definitely yeah. teaches you how to be vulnerable and so many other things like alongside that, it's like grit, hard work, determination consistency the importance of like you know um working on yourself working on your craft like so many different things and like when i have my kids in the future hopefully i have a son you know football is definitely something that i want him to play because it, it the the level of discipline and stuff like that that it teaches you and the hard work like i still remember you know 90 95 degree summers we in full pads doing bear crawls on turf that's burning up like mm-hmm. you know all that 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 build that you know those battle scars like that builds you into you know being comfortable and into with being comfortable with the discomfort right and it just you know football definitely played a massive role in helping me become who i am today definitely i wish i would have played sooner i didn't start as i said till eighth grade money was a big reason for that uh but i was I, you know i had an opportunity and one of the the guys i was friends with at the time in middle school he was like john every year he was like john you got you got to play this year and they found some way for me to like to get some scholarships so eighth grade year i played and you know that was probably the best decision I ever made. So we're going to move from high school to college. And yeah. you went to UConn, which, I mean, everybody knows UConn, you know, sports mostly. <laughs> <laughs> but what what made you want to go there? And was it was it hard to get in? I mean, that's supposed yeah, to be so a pretty, been, pretty good university. <laughs> yeah, so it was an interesting story. So I got into 13 schools, um, got denied two five of which I had D2 or D3 offer to play football. And so I had the opportunity to play at the next level. Not anything big, but, you know, I had some opportunities to play. And so in my head, it was like, I love football with everything I got, right? But do I love it as a job? That was the big question for me. And I couldn't say that I did. Because uh, even mm-hmm. though you're not getting paid in college, I mean, they are. I think they are now with the stuff they got going on with the NCAA. But, um, and that's something I could I got love to do as a job. And so I was like, okay, um, I'm actually not going to continue, you know, uh, football. And I, and I knew for a fact I wasn't going to the league. And I, uh, so I was like, do I really want to change my whole thing for something that I'm going to let go after I graduate anyways? And so I was like, you know, I wanted to go into Howard. That's one of the schools I got denied to. Then I wanted to go to Pace because Pace was in New York City. And I wanted to go into business. And so I was like, what better school than a school in the heart of New York City? But that was a private school. So I ended up choosing UConn because of the money. But what UConn tried to do is they put me in the general school, which they put like anyone that doesn't make it into like the more designated school, like school of business, school of art, you know, school of medicine, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, they tried to put me in like the general school for the people. And then um, what had happened was, I had already planned that summer trip to DR. That was pl- been in the plan. So I could, they wanted me to go to the summer program as well, but I couldn't go. And so when I told them I couldn't go, it was a bunch of emailing back and forth. When I told them I couldn't go, then they tried to transfer me from the main campus to the Stanford campus. And I was like, hey, no, mm. we're not going to do that. So I'm, I'm going to the main campus. And then one of my boys that I played football with was also accepted, but he was accepted in the school of business and he was in the business connections learning community. And the only way you can dorm in the BCLC is to be a part of the BCLC. And the only way you can be a part of the BCLC is to be a part of the School of Business. So I had to go back and yeah, forth. Yeah. And they were trying to put me to the Stanford campus because I couldn't go to the summer program that they had. So after reaching out, I finally got to the School of Business. And then I finally got, uh, I got waitlisted for the BCLC. But then I finally got into, um, 
into that. And then I finally was able to room with him. And I say all that to say, um, it definitely was a lot of back and forth emailing and stuff like that. But for me, my main decision to go to college in general was to learn how to network and to learn how to live my own, really, and get that experience. Man, that is probably the two biggest things that you can pull from college because it's not necessarily always about the information that you're going to get from these courses. Yeah. A lot of times it's about who you're going to meet in these courses, what connections are you going to make in things like the BCLC, you know, in different clubs, organizations, um, your sorority or fraternity, if you choose to go that route. Like when you start to build these relationships, we talked about it. Here we go. It's coming back. Yeah. We talked about it earlier, but when you start to build these relationships with people, those are the things that are going to propel you to the next level, you know, because any job that you get most of the time, they're going to teach you what you need to know to be able to do the job, right? The paper that is kind of the things that, that get you in the door. And sometimes it's the connection over the paper can also get you in the door. So those are two really great reasons to go to college, learn how to live mm -hmm. on your own and to make the connections. Um, how did you get into BCLC? Like, what was your, I mean, you said you had a friend, but why'd you choose that specific uh, organization to do, to do it with? Yeah. So the BCLC I joined because, um, one, it was like, I want, I wanted to be in a school of business and the only way to be in a B BCLC is to be in a school of business. So it's like, it was already there. And a lot of the different school, like, uh, different like schools within UConn, like they all had their own learning community, not all of them, but a lot of them did. Uh, there was a Hispanic one. There was um um uh there was like a couple others that you could you could join that weren't like school specific. Like anyone from any school could join, but like definitely the BCLC for me it was it was intentional because one I also wanted to room with my boy. I didn't know anyone else at the school, and I didn't want to be with a stranger my first year because I I've done heard some horror stories about people not getting along with they their roommate, um and so I was like you know. I'm going to just go that route. It's already up the alley that I want to get going with the school of business. Um, and so I'll definitely be able to make a lot. And I already knew in high school about the importance of networking and making connections. That's why when I got to college, I was like, you know, where could I make the most meaningful, impactful connections? And it's not going to be someone in some other industry, which I don't want to do. It's probably going to be the people in the industry that I'm planning on heading into. At least planned on why, heading into. Because why business? Not. So for me, business kind of, so I wasn't a natural born entrepreneur ever, right? And this is like, kind of like awakened, I guess you could say. I wasn't selling, you know, candy. I wasn't selling lemonade. I, was, I didn't have a paper route. I wasn't mowing lawns. I wasn't shoveling snow. You know, I, I, I <laughs> had, you know, friends that were flipping sneakers and stuff like that. And, but the entrepreneur in me was never there. But for business, I was like, what could I want to do? Well, I kind of like marketing and I'm very creative and I was like, I know business paid well. And I had an internship my senior year. And I was very fortunate because that year, this lady that just so happens to be the CMO of Cantor Fitzgerald, which is a pretty big corporate company in the, in the city, um, she was partnering up with the lady who ran an internship program. And so I was one of the few students selected. And I wasn't actually in, I was actually in, although she's the CMO, I was in the finance department. Um, and that very last day, they had a lunch and I went to the lunch and I sat down in the lunch and, you know, it was just a genuine conversation. And I have all these like C-suite mm -hmm. execs. It was like probably like 10 or 15, like 10 or 12 of us, uh, the CMO, uh, the vice president, and a couple other people that worked in that department. And, you know, the stories they were telling, it was just like, it was just a funny time. It was just like good, good time. And I was like, okay, you know, I think marketing, like if I'm going to be working in something and, and the people around me are like this. I think I could enjoy that. So it was like, all right, let me just go into marketing. That sounds kind of like my story of going to school, which I'll tell like really quickly. I was taking a friend to uh, DeVry University and my mm -hmm. brother was with me. I was the person with the car. So I pretty much drove us everywhere. We, us three, we was always kind of together. So I'm like, all right, I'll drive. So my brother and I were sitting in the, the lounge just kind of yeah. waiting. And this lady walks in. She's like, you know, hey, what are y'all doing here? I'm like, oh, you know, I brought our friend up here. He's applying, whatever. So she goes, are y'all in school? No. Okay. Do y'all want to be in school? We look at each other. We say, sure. 
And so right <laughs> there, we just kind of got signed up and we ended up in school. And I'm the only person that graduated with a degree. Neither yeah. one of them uh, stayed with it, but it just kind of happened on a meet some cool people. They ask you some questions and you just kind of fall you into it. this yeah. place. You didn't even know that you, yeah, that you would end up. So that's going to actually bring us to our, our next number, which is one or a thousand, because you have this quote in your email signature that says, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Yeah. So what was the one step for you that led you into real estate? Because a lot of your stuff um, on Instagram and that you've talked about was a lot of centered. It was really centered around real estate. And based yeah. on our conversation uh, that we had earlier, your steps have led you even to something different than that. So what was that one step that kind of got you into real estate? And what was that experience like? So my first step, it's, and I'll, I'll give you a little background before I get into it. So it's the pandemic took over the world. I'm, mm. I'm sitting at home, right? I, my sophomore year just started. It's the fall of 2020. And um, I can't remember what it was, but I found myself in Barnes & Noble and I picked up three books. Don't know why I was there, but I picked up Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Index Funds for Dummies, and a book called I Will Teach You to Be Rich. So I read Rich Dad Poor Dad first and I realized, so it's not the world's greatest book, but it is a really good book and it shifts your perspective um, enough, especially for my situation. As I said, I grew up very humbly. Um, I didn't really have much and I didn't think much of it because that's just for me. That's just how life was. I didn't know that, you know, we weren't supposed to be, you know, boiling water to take showers and stuff like that. That's just like how it was right for me. Like growing up, I didn't question it. That's what it was. Right. And so I read Rich Dad Poor Dad and I realized like the way the poor dads, you know, spoke and taught and thought is the same way my grandparents kind of spoke and taught and thought as well. And I was like, okay. And the rich dad, he's saying X, Y, Z. There's another way of viewing the world out there that's not being taught at school. That's not being talked about with my friends. That's not being talked about Mm -hmm. with these professors and these other people. And so I was like, all right, let me keep on reading. So I started reading more. And then that winter break, I got onto YouTube University and I just started watching videos on double speed, uh, which also doesn't help the fact that I talk fast because that just makes me want to talk faster because everything I watch is also <laughs> extremely fast paced. Right. And so I would I just jumped down a rabbit hole of looking into personal finance stuff. And I seen this one class. It was 500 bucks is how to get into wholesaling and real estate. For anyone that doesn't really know, wholesaling essentially is let's say you have a house, Tony, and I'm the wholesaler. Let's say you want to sell the house but it probably won't sell on the market, right? Or you have some some situation. I'll get the the pretty much the house under contract and then I'll find a buyer, match make you two. You know, let's say you want to sell it for 100. The guy, he'll buy it for 110. I make the $10,000 difference. You sell your house, the buyer gets the house. Everyone wins, win, win. And an attorney um, I was speaking to, I, I spoke to about five or six, most of which didn't know what they were talking about. They were like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. One guy did. And he was like, oh, you're talking about wholesaling. You can't do that in Connecticut, although you can. Make sure to check with your state, whatever state you're in. Um, but in Connecticut, you could do it. And the attorney clearly didn't work with investors. And so he kind of like killed my dream, essentially. I was like, okay, I guess real estate's not for me. And then it wasn't until I um, I went out to eat with one of my guys. We was catching up. I haven't seen him in a while. And he ended up walking off a little bit. He ran into one of my old counselors, Boys and Girls Club. And so they were talking and he wanted to get into real estate at that time. And so I was like, yo, where, where'd he go? I ended up seeing them by the bar and um, I hopped into their conversation. And then he, they were setting up a time to meet with this guy in commercial real estate. And I got to know, I asked to be on a call with them. And from there, I was like, oh, I could probably go the agent route. I, I might just get my license. So I ended up decided to stop. So this is spring of 2021. I was like, I'm not showing up to none of my college classes anymore. I'm signed up for my real estate university class and it just kind of ran from there. And that's how I got into real estate. Man, that's like, like yeah. a switch. So, like, yep, done with this. <laughs> I <laughs> found something else that I want to do. And I think yeah. that's how it is sometimes, right? You're, you're working at what you, at what you want to do until you go, huh, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then hopefully 
you find something else that you want to do and you go, all right, time to change courses. So yeah. do you believe like, do you believe that you have to have like a plan A, B and C kind of all in the back of your mind? Or do you think of it differently? I think I'm more of a burn all ships person, right? Burn all ships or retreat. You make it, find a way, make a way, create a way, whatever you got to do. But retreating is not an option. Backing out is not an option. Right. And they say like what making a plan B is pretty much planning to fail. Essentially it's, or so it's like, you know, for me getting into real estate and leaving school, as I said early on, and to bring it full circle, I went into school to network, learn how to live my own. I can't network if everyone has their cameras off and the only person talking is the professor. And I can't learn how to live my Yeah. Right. And I, and I can't learn how to live my own if I'm waking out of bed, signing on to Zoom calls from my bed. And like, so it's like, you know, I wasn't learning how to live my own. I wasn't networking. So the decision to leave school was extremely easy for me, especially once mm-hmm. I realized that there's another way out there. Right. And I realized, oh, I could teach myself all this stuff. I could buy a class and learn more about real estate than any of these people know, uh, know about. I was like, yeah. Um, and for me, so I think one of the biggest uh, things, and this will kind of segue into what my main focus now is, but like for me, as you said, like we kind of, sometimes we might wake up and be like, Hey, actually, this is not what I want to do. And then figuring out how to a plan to, you know, uh, mm-hmm. make that successful. And then from there, well, the biggest thing for me that led me where I'm at right now is procrastination. And the beauty of procrastination is that the, the beauty of procrastination is that pretty much it, it, it tells you something. It gives you time to reflect because if you know you're supposed to be doing something and you're not doing it, although you know you should be doing it, then it's like, why aren't you doing it? And so for me, I was procrastinating with real estate. I wasn't doing what I had to do. I wasn't prospecting. I wasn't doing what I had to do in terms of you know um, following up and looking for deals and driving around and stuff like that. And I wasn't finding the success that I had planned for myself. And then I started the social media marketing agency and in that, you know, in that realm, I wasn't finding the success I was, you know, planning to, to get as well. And so it's like every time I found myself procrastinating, it was always one thing, the podcast. So now I'm super excited for this upcoming year because it's like for the first time in a very long time, I'm not working on multiple endeavors at the same time. It's like all my focus, all my clarity. And now I'm planning and I'm planning to do one thing because you could make a plan. But if you have a plan for this. And you have another plan for something in an entirely different area and something else. It's like they're all bound to fail, even if you don't have a plan B for any of them. You just like you had three mm. plan A's, you know, which are you only there's only one of you. There's only one in your brain. It's like you can't focus on all those things. For me, I was like, you know, I'm just going to scrap all those ideas. I'm still a licensed realtor. And that's more going to be so, more so just because like I can make I have referrals across the country even even out the country. So it's like I can just send out a referral and get paid a referral fee from that. And it's like. I don't have to show any of the houses. I don't have to open any doors, lock any houses, turn on any lights. I could just get paid essentially passively. Um, and then, but that procrastination led me to being able to realize, have some time to reflect and figure out what it is that I really want to do. And because sometimes you hear the phone ringing and that's your calling, right? But if you got multiple phone ringings, it's like, you know, how do you know which one's the right one? And it's the, mm. the one that doesn't shut off, right? I picked up the real estate phone for a little bit. Uh, you know, and I picked up the social media phone for a little bit, but the phone that just kept on ringing, right, is just the podcast. And now it's like, okay, maybe this is the one where I need to go all in on. Now it's like planning to how do I take this from just a, a weekly episode into something that's more like yeah. a movement, into something like that's like a community into something so much bigger than just a weekly episode. Man, it's amazing that you keep chipping away, chipping away, keep talking about it. So I think it's the perfect time to introduce our next number. And that's 51, because I think that's about how many episodes you have. And I believe you started in January of this year. So the Walk to Wealth podcast is up, it's rolling, you've been doing your thing. I want to ask this question, because I think you've alluded to it a little bit, but where does the intersection of purpose and wealth happen for you? Because I know that's something that's very, I, I feel like both are very important to you. So how do those things cross paths? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a great question. And for me, the whole idea of Walk to Wealth, right? It's so then how I got the name is for the 99% of us that are overnight sensation, 
The journey to wealth is a long walk. And some may walk faster than others, but what good is sprinting to the finish line if you pass out when you cross it? And a lot mm. of times we, with hustle culture, with, you know, all these people telling you to grind, 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 it's like you could lose yourself really quickly. And so it's like, is it worth all of that? If by the time, pardon me, if by the time you actually get to where you want to get to, you know, you, you came and enjoy it. And so that's kind of for me, like the, the, re, the meaning behind the name. And I knew, like, as I said, once I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I realized there's a whole other way of viewing the world that people aren't talking about and something got to be up. And then once I started teaching myself about how to build credit, you know, how to invest in index funds and which bank accounts I should use and which savings accounts should I use and interest rates and APR and all that personal finance, like all that personal finance jazz, I was like, I didn't learn a single piece of this uh, in school <laughs> at all whatsoever. And that's a that's an issue. Right. Because I was to learning some good information and you would hope that, you know, they would teach that in school just so that we could all be educated. But it's like uh, they don't. But the, nevertheless, the information is still out there. And so, like, for me, mm -hmm. that's kind of where, like, the the idea of Walk to Wealth kind of like why it was so important to me to talk about, like, financial literacy. And just so because, like, and I feel like also, too, for like in my community and, the you know, whether it was in the projects and in my own household, it's like, Mine you know, too. yeah, it's like, you know, we don't talk about that stuff. And the only time it's about money, it's, it's when you're having, oh, I got more than you or how much money you got. Oh, and, and people want to flex. They want to show off. They want to, you know, that's the only time money's a conversation. And it's like, no, like, how do we build wealth? You know, how do we get to, you know, a million dollar net worth, $10 million net worth? You know, how do we, you know, I got taxes coming up, you know, who's a good CPA, you know, what, you know, what strategies can I use? What can I write off? Like things like that was never a conversation mm. anywhere. So I was like, if I could find a way and with podcasting, it gives you the opportunity to reach out to people you have no business reaching out to. So I was like, All right, I got my, I got myself a little bit of a platform here. Let me start making some connection. As I said, I was going to the investor meetups right. and all this stuff. So I was, you know, starting to have conversations with them. And like, I always knew that I didn't want to wait to become successful before I started giving back. I'm still on my journey and I wanted to do something that's like a little bit more relatable. I wanted to get back, you know, I don't got it all put together, but I'm, I'm on the right path. And I know a lot of people mm -hmm. that already have it put together. So it's like, how can I kind of bridge the gap between the two? And that's kind of where um, the, the, the passion of reasoning, the drive behind my podcast is. And I feel like my purpose uh, personally is to enlighten and empower young adults to build wealthy, abundant lives. It's feel like what I feel like I was called for to do and purpose. The thing with purpose that's so beautiful is that I could spend the rest of my life doing that and I would never impact all the young adults. I would never reach all the people I could reach out to potentially. Right. So it's like, it's like a never ending pursuit. You said something that I hear all the time because I am a high school teacher and yeah. people always say, why don't we learn about this kind of stuff? Right finance. Why don't we learn about taxes and all of this stuff in high school? So I have a couple of rebuttals to that. Uh, number one, what better place to learn how money works than in your own home? I mm -hmm. honestly believe people's parents should be teaching them those things because guess where you eat at? Where do you sleep at? Where do you spend money? You spend it at home. You don't spend it in school. I mean, you may be buying lunch, but- Or college. The college, you're going to spend a couple of yeah. Oh yeah, college. There's that. That's a totally different story. That's a different kind of personal finance. But when you're when you're growing up, right, and you're asking your parents, well, you know, I need a prom dress. I need to do this for homecoming. Can I have tickets to the game? Like those are prime opportunities for parents or whoever you live with, auntie, uncle, grandparents, to teach you the value of money and what you can spend, what you can't spend, what you need to save, what you need to invest. And I know that the problem is that many people at home don't know those things either. But guess mm -hmm. where those people go to? Those people are also teachers, right? Many teachers don't even know these things. So who, mm -hmm. are, who are you expecting to, to teach you this? And I believe that it wasn't until recently that there was a, a certification or a class that you could get and go to to learn these things to then be able to teach them as a class. You can't just like teach whatever you want to. You know, that's not how things work. Now, yeah. you do have people like myself who like to teach these life lessons 
whenever you have the time and space to do so, right? So you can kind of cross that line, like with your kids and talk about finances and talk about like car notes. And if you want to use some of your own personal story to tell those, I think that's a great way to make a connection with kids and teach them about that stuff. But it's not as easy as just, oh, we should be teaching all of this stuff in high school. Like we should be learning all of this stuff. My rebuttal is parent, you should be teaching them this because they spending your money. So (laughs) how about you stop being scared? Okay, you stop trying to hide the finances from your kids and you actually bring them in. This is what's happening. This is why we can't afford it, or this is why we can, or this is why you have to work for it. This is why I'm working until 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. So then kids will begin to learn the value of money and how to save and how to invest in those things. So I'm jumping off of my soapbox now. <laughs> when, when people say that, I'm just kind of like, Let's unpack that because it's not as just straightforward and easy as people like to think it may be. So, yeah. But it is definitely very important to learn those things. And, and hopefully you have a mix of learning it at school and you're getting that teaching also at home in the direct application of how you spend your parents' money. Because most of us know <laughs> that's whose money you're spending. <laughs> so what's your favorite part of podcasting so far? Honestly, just meeting people, can the networking aspect, which isn't shouldn't be too surprising. I like networking. I like, you know, connecting. I'm a very social person, uh, so like just meeting people. And now that I'm, you know, talking to other people on other people's show, it's like now I get to meet double the people because before it was only just on my podcast, so it's like kind of one sided. But now I get to have like good conversation with people on other people's show now. So it's like. I'm going to meet double the people that I, I was meeting before. And I'm also going to, you know, my first podcast expo, podcast expo in January, mm-hmm. which is like a conference Talk for podcasters. Yeah. So I'm actually going to be a speaker there. So I applied mm-hmm. to be a speaker in September. Um, I wanted to be like a 30 to 45 minute speaker or something like that. Um, and that was, I think that was on a main stage and they denied me, but there was like, Hey, you could be a Petra Kutcher speaker, a uh, speaker, which is like a five minute Ted talk. And they were going to comp my ticket uh, to attend. I was like, sure. Nice. Yeah, I'd love that opportunity. So I'm going to be you know, going down there in Orlando in January to talk to you know, a bunch of other podcasters. And you know, I only have five minutes. So I, I, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I still am not sure what exactly I'm going to talk about because I have to be, <laughs> my goal is to be as impactful as possible um, right. within, the, within the time, uh, the short time that I, I, I was gifted. And so, you know, I'm excited for there because I'm also going with a, a person that I met. I went to a speaker school a while back and a guy that I met there also started his podcast recently. So me and him are going. So it's going to be a great, you know, time to network, meet people. There's going to be like, you know, dinners and parties and stuff like that. So it's like, oh, yeah, I'm getting to meet a bunch of like other podcasters from a bunch of different areas and just make some more connection in the industry. Have you um, looked up other, you know, festivals or expos or that kind of thing yeah. where a bunch of people who have podcasts or are in the podcast industry come together? Have you, have you looked up other ones, plan on going yeah. to any other ones? So I got to So as I said, I wasn't expecting to come into this year with the intentionality that I do now that my podcast is what I wanted to grow. So a lot of the events that I planned on going to were still real estate, you know, conferences and events. Mm. And so it's like, I'm going to go to a couple of those and, those are going to definitely eat away at my budget. One's in in, uh, in Anaheim, which is definitely going to be a pricey trip. And then the other one, luckily Ooh. I have points. So I built up my points. So I'm going to be paying for a lot of this stuff for points. Um, and the other one's going to be in Orlando. So though, if I weren't going to those two, I would definitely have a lot more you know, time and a lot more money to go to some other events. But I, I looked at the PodFest movement. Um, there's like an indie PodFest. There's... um. Hi, I'm I'm blanking out a little bit, but there are some more that interested me that I want to go to. And if I take the podcast where it needs to be, that will definitely bring some more income to, you know, have the funds to then pay for these trips and stuff like that. Because, you know, I could pay right. for flight and travel with, with points, but I can't play for entries, entry tickets with points. So, <laughs> Man, I went to podcast movement in August. And really? it was a blast. Yes. The really good thing is it was in Dallas, which is a four hour drive from where I am yeah. in Houston. 
So I have a sister that stays up there. So I went up there and I stayed with her for only one night though. She's married. I mean, we're cool. Love my sister. Shout a Asia, shout out. Um, but I got my own little hotel pretty close and it was you would love it. Cause everybody was just so cool. Like it was people who had just started, people who had been doing it for you know, over a decade, there were people who were uh, on the other side, like, uh, like hosting as well as like, like selling mics and all kind of anything that was related to podcasts. Those people were mm. there and it was a ton of fun. I've had a bunch of people that I met there on my podcast. So there's, I have a ton of pictures and stuff all on, on IG, but <sighs> yeah, man, podcast movement. I can just say personally, when I went to that one, Man, it was it was crazy. It was so it was such a great experience. I'm trying to go again next year, and it's in Colorado, uh, yeah. Denver. It's in Denver. Yeah, so my high city. I'm trying to to see what's up. Yeah, I, if I can go, I'm definitely planning on going. That's another one because I think it's Podfest Expo and Pod the movement. I think they're run by the same people. Mm-hmm. I think so. I, I see I, both I'm, of them. There's a couple of uh, there's like podcast movement and then there's like pod fest i think there's no. like a couple of different ones that are kind of big then i th- movement uh podcast movement has like another one called evolutions i think that's in january yeah. so i think that's in vegas kinda, right? yeah it is I think it is there's so, a, there's I mean, a bunch I of them that look good there's a bunch of them so i know podcast movement was super cool and very beneficial for me just with networking and sometimes you go to those things and you just kind of realize like I'm I'm on the right track. I don't necessarily need to redo what I'm doing. I may need to tweak a few things here and there, but you go, dang, okay. They said my stuff was cool. They said my stuff was cool. Like, all right. Like it's just more validation as opposed to like, man, I gotta my idea is trash. I gotta rework it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's been your like your favorite podcast moment so far like do you have an episode that kind of reaffirmed you like reassured you like okay like what i just said okay what i'm doing is really good and i just need to keep going do you have a yes. episode or a moment like that i'd say honestly i i'm not sure if i have an episode like that but i do have an episode that is my favorite episode of the one i interviewed um definitely probably like the one that I interviewed this guy named Vic Manzo, and he's like big into like law. Oh, I know Vic. Like, you know Vic? He's, Man, he's a that pretty dude is guy. electric. Yeah, he's great, and he was like, because when you hear like law of attraction and manifestation, everyone says is it, it's all the same stuff that always people are talking about. He got into the depth with it. He got into like another level of it, um, and mm-hmm. like really broke it down and made like made it make sense. And so that that was one of my favorite episodes. And I actually learned a lot personally from that episode. And then one of my other big moments that I'd say is my favorite. So the head of the of the head of diversity for Keller Williams, the entire company, I had her on a podcast. Her episode dropped in September. So interviewing her, mm-hmm. and it's funny how me and her got connected. So I went to a conference. It was the family reunion. It was for Keller Williams. Um, but any agent can go um, regardless of the company. And so I went there and I was literally standing in this walkway. I was figuring out who I was going to meet up with because I was supposed to meet somebody. I'm down in Orlando. don't know where I'm supposed to go. I'm just in this like little restaurant, like um, strip mall kind of place. And she was eating and um, went at a table with a couple of people. I didn't recognize um, anyone. I knew that she was the lady that spoke on stage. I didn't know she, what her position was. I just knew that she was on the big stage with everyone. And she kind of like uh, signaled me to come over. And I'm kind of like taken with surprise. I was like, Oh, and so me and her, I started, you know, we connected and right there and uh, we spoke and then that was pretty much it. And then I went in Austin in August to another Keller Williams event. And then we were at a networking forum and over there uh, and it's not, so I like networking and there was some, I I was a little tipsy. So honestly, I wasn't planning on, I seen her, I wasn't planning on saying anything. So just because, you know, you (laughs) you know, I want to be more presentable, right? I, I was a little, a little tipsy. So. But then she, we ended up talking again and, you know, I was telling her about, you know, what I had going on and the podcast, stuff like that. She was like, I'd love to be on it. And, you know, so we got connected. I reached out to her assistant and we got it scheduled. We got her interview and mm-hmm. her just like, 
getting her on the show. And now she's actually going to be someone that's speaking at the virtual summit. So it's like, I made a really good connection yeah. there. So it's like, um, and it's like also too, but like valuing myself. Cause yeah, she's super big and she has it going, but it's also too, like, I have something going too. Cause I'm helping push her name out even more in front to front and more people. So it's like knowing that, Hey, like, Hey, this is not just, you know, and literally like the other day I had someone reach out and was like, not reach out, but like I was at a networking event. Um, and they were like, Oh, I would love to be on your show. And just like so many people just ask to be on your show because they want to share their story and, you know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. get the rushes out there. And it's like, you didn't even take the time to see what my show is even about. I just say, I have a podcast. Hey, I'd love to be on your show. <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's like, you're in a club and let's say you see a chick and she says, I'm single. It's like, Oh, let, let me take you back to my house. But that's the, yeah, the I'd first love to be sentence. Your boyfriend. No big deal. Uh, let, let's get married. Like, right? It's like, um, <laughs> actually, <out>. no. <laughs> like, yeah, like, actually, uh, no, I'll pass on that, right? But, like, that's the, their opening line. They don't ask any questions to hear what it's mm. about first. And it's like, man, I done spent all this time working on this, you know, marketing, recording, looking up how to do all this stuff just for you to freaking come by and ask me to say, hey, I want to be on your show. It's like, bro, I literally, like, you didn't even get to know what my show is about before even asking you. And I was just like, people like that, just like, Man, like, I'm sure you have a great message, a great story, but it's like the amount of effort, like for me, before I even started reaching out to people, like I was like, I think on episode like 43 of my own podcast, almost a year. And before I even started reaching out Mm. to people to hop on theirs and before I started reaching out to hop on people's podcast, I probably spent like four days, like looking into how to ask people. I like how to pitch, how to send a, a a pitch to hop on someone's show. Like I put so much thought and effort into you before yeah. I reach out to yeah, people yeah. for you to just come up and say, Hey, I want to be on your show. That's it. I was like, no, <laughs> I didn't say no like that, but like in my head, that's my first thought. And yeah, so like, um, man, get out of here. Yeah. Like, so, um, that, that that's like one of the, the bad parts about podcasting because like now i i i introduce myself as like instead of it used to be like hey i'm a realtor with keller williams now it's like hey i'm a podcast host uh you know i'm the host of the walk to podcast and so it's like i hear podcasts and it's like you know the whole conversation now talks about oh like yeah. them wanting to be on a show it's like bro you just not, now you're making a conversation odd it's it's like i would compare it to when people say that they have a business it's kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, that's that's cool. You got your little business. It's mm-hmm. like, like, right? You know that that feeling. It's it's almost like it's the same. They're kind of down. They're downplaying it when they don't actually know like how big it is or what it could be or the work that goes into it. And I don't really think people do it on on purpose. Not all the time. Some people, yeah, they do. But I feel like it's just kind of one of those things that people don't understand. Until you maybe see what goes into it to go, oh, okay. Okay, there's a lot that has to happen for you to even do one episode, let alone doing an episode every week and then having a different person on every week. Like there's a lot of work that goes into a lot of planning, a lot of connections. Go ahead. And I was going to say too, like, it's like if I walked up and I seen Joe Rogan, I'm mm. not asking him, can I hop on your show? That's the last thing mm. I would ask him. Like, right? Because like, it's kind of like the audacity on, in a way. In, in a little bit, it's like, I put in all this work into something, it's like, you're just going to walk on like, like it ain't nothing kind of type of well, thing. Well, there is something to be said for just, you know, shooting your shot. I go, you know that, what? Yeah. That's Joe Rogan. Like, why wouldn't I want to be on his podcast? His podcast is amazing and he's built it into the number one podcast in the world so regardless of what you think of him or his views or whatever like you can't knock the hustle like you can't knock the work like it speaks for itself so that's one of the people that that's one of the people that inspired me the most and it's just kind of how he's structured his podcast Mm -hmm. and what he does and who he has on like you can have Mike Tyson or you can have Neil deGrasse Tyson. Like it could be anybody. <laughs> so that for me was like, I want to do it like that. That yeah. inspired me to go, you know what? You don't have to kind of fit into a box at all. Like I'm going to do the podcast that I want to do. And from there, you know, people will gravitate to it because of me. And I think that's how you really build a strong following. What would yeah. you say like your 
your kind of approach is in that way. Yeah. So like for me, um, and from just real quick, just, you know, from one podcast to another, like I appreciate, you know, the time you go put into it, everything and the, the whole format of your show too, like, it's like the numbers and it's like, I, I didn't understand it at first until I checked yeah. out a couple of your episodes and then now also being recorded live, it's like, Oh, so he got these numbers. I thought he was like, I don't know if he was going with like the, you know, the, some angel numbers or whatever, but it's like, Oh, he's taking numbers from like my past story. <laughs> and like, I, I didn't know where you were going with it at first until I checked out your episode just to make sure before I hopped on. So I, I kind of know. Yeah. And so it's like, you, but the, the amount of thought you put into this is like really dope, man. I, so from one podcast to another, you, you know, I appreciate what you appreciate got going that. on. Um, but my approach is kind of, so, um, the whole story is the walk to wealth podcast, right? That's, that's the name of the show. And I always start off, I do a quick intro, right. That I record outside of the show. But, um, I start off with, you know, tell us about your walk to wealth. It's a bit of a play on words. Cause it's also the name of the show, but it's like, you know, as you probably already know, if people can't resonate with your story, whatever you say afterwards is, is it's on deaf ears, right? Because there's right. an abundance of information. There's information overload at this point, right? There's too much information. So the only way that I could make you connect with somebody really now is having that story, having that, like, I can relate to yeah. that person, essentially. So I always start off, like, tell us your walk to wealth. And some people are kind of surface level. It's like, yeah, you know, I grew up, you know, in, in, in Connecticut. And then I went to college. I studied marketing. And then, you know, it's like, um, nah, it's like, nah let's, get into the, let's get into stuff. it. Like, yeah. And so that's the part that also kind of sucks because some people either, A, they don't really know their story. B, they don't know how to tell their story. Or C, their story, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's them not wanting to share or they don't actually have much of a story. But it's like some people, it's like, I, I try to ask the question to dig it out of them, but there, it, there ain't much to dig out. So it's like that, that always kind of sucks. Cause you know, as I said, everyone's an expert and everyone really has a story one and two no has the skill to tell that story in a way that, mm. you know, compels and captivates people. And then from there, I usually go into whatever the topic of the conversation is. And I, I like having a little bit more conversational, but I like it. I always ask people before they hop on, you know, um, what is the one problem you would solve or like, and then I always ask, is that applicable to 18 to 22 year olds? Because if you're saying, let's go invest in X, Y, Z, and the minimum investment is 50,000, you, you're on the wrong show. Right. But then I also have, <laughs> I have people where I talked about that, like, for example, syndications is one of them, it's usually a high entry point to get in. And, but it's like one of those things where it's like, you don't know what you don't know unless you're having these, you know, they call it the, the, the golf course community, like, con you know, co conversations, right? If you're not in, in, in the, in the club, in the clubhouse, it, it's hard to hear a lot of mm -hmm. these things. So sometimes I bring on people that I know people my age can't even invest with right now, just for like awareness sake, because awareness is power too. So it's like, how do I, we tell these people about this stuff now? So like when they do have the money. And they, they know where to put it. Like for me, I wanted to get into syndications, right? I'm nowhere near the point where I have the money to invest in that, but I know about it. And I could tell you more about it than most other realtors, than most other people in the space, just because like the amount of people I know in there. So like once I'm in a position to have the money, that's like, I already know for the most part, the majority of it, I just got to right. do a little more due diligence and I'm good. Right. But that comes from awareness. That comes from knowing. I, I know that opportunity is available. And so um, sometimes, as I said, I'll have people just for awareness sake. And then I have people that, you know, uh, kind of hop in and they have more of a, a, a practical strategic approach kind of type of thing. And so I usually, my main four pillars is like personal finance, real estate, entrepreneurship, and mindset are kind of like the four pillars I talk about. And then I end mm -hmm. the show, you know, with the quick call to action, like, Hey, where can we find you? And then after that, I ask the final four questions. And the first one, and then these questions are more so like thought provoking. So it's always, you know, what is the most impactful lesson you learned in life? Then I asked, what's the most admirable trait um, a person can have? Then I asked, if you had to change someone's life with one book, what would you recommend? And then I finished off with, what is the legacy that you're trying to leave behind? And I always ask those four mm. questions at the very end. And uh, just to kind of get a little bit more into, you know, you know, who are you? And, you know, get a little bit more because aside from the expert advice that they were given in the episode, it's like, hey, let right. me hear some, some advice that can really shift somebody that can really, you know, uh, it makes change somebody's day. And so that's kind of the format that I go on. And I, I kind of, as I said, base everyone really off of, you know, what can, what can my listeners take away from them making an appearance? And is that something they would want to hear? And getting so real intentional about, you know, because I may find someone interesting, but is my ideal avatar, you know, if my, are my listeners going to find mm. that person interesting? 
So like getting more intentional with that is something that I've been starting to do a lot more recently. I mean, you must be looking at my notes because that's going to listen to our three what's <laughs> from one podcast host to another. Uh, so you can take as long or as short as you would like uh, with these questions. So my first what is what's an opinion that you have that will be considered unpopular? I love this question or questions like this, right? Because especially where I grew up in, but Yo, for the amount, and this might be a little, a little, a little, uh, Ooh, spicy. some people the, the wrong way a little bit, but we are not victims, bro. Uh, we are not victims. Mm. We're, we are not, you know, we have as much opportunity when you really start to look within and you really learn about the mind. We can do so many things. And it's just like so many people have this scarcity mindset. That, oh, you know, for whatever reason. But as I said earlier, we, there's an abundance of information. There's an abundance of opportunity. There's an abundance of so many things if you put yourself in the right place. It doesn't matter your upbringing. doesn't matter, you know, as I said, I, I my parents didn't really play a, a role in my life. My grandparents didn't speak English. We still, we still were, you know, have Section 8, stuff like that. It's like there's so many times where I could have played the victim card and, you know, but mm. it's like, as I said, it's like once you see the light, you can't unsee it. I've seen the opportunities out there and the people that you could meet, like these people that are successful, that they are rich and evil. It's like, yeah, these people, that's one thing that everyone respects cross culture is hustle. And they see that you have a good work ethic and that you're trying to get after it, whatever it may be, people are going to want to help you. People, especially older people, right? Older people, they see something that's like, hey, he got it going. He's only 20. I don't even know what he got yeah. going on, but I want to help him. Right. No matter if it's that's in real estate or that's, you know, you want to do some day trading or that's, you know, starting a hair salon business or whatever it may be. Like these people that are out there that really got it popping, that are really successful, really genuinely want to help and give back and pave yeah. the way forward. Because that's all you can do. Once you make it to the top, there ain't nothing else to do but, you know, help pave the way for the next man, for the next woman. Right. So it's like getting out of that mindset of like, man, you know. They don't want me to be successful or, you know, the government is, has it out against me and stuff like that. And it's like, and make it anyways. Now, find now it anyways. What? Yeah. Now, now what? Like yeah, they, everyone hates you. And now what? Right. Oh, you know, they don't want people like me, my color to be successful. It's like, and now what? Are you going to make a way for yourself or, or are you going to let the narrative, you know, dictate your life? Right. Because we all have the power to, you know, design our life, to write out the life the way we want to live. Right. Most people, as I said, when we're kids, we have that creativity, that power, that like anything is possible. And then as we get older, it's just more so realize, like figuring out how do I get back to that inner child that we lose mm. with society, with societal pressures, with all these different, you know, cultural things that we're, you know, we're brought into and traumas and all that stuff. It's like, how do I get through all that mess to tap back into my inner child, the me who I'm really supposed to be? right? The me that can do anything, that anything is possible, right? And it's just finding your way back to that stuff. But when you start living on life and you start working, you start throwing on bills, all this thing just clogs up mm -hmm. your, your brain. It clogs the mind a little bit. So it's like, you know, I, I love giving that advice because as I said, I started a podcast called Walk the World knowing that I'm not wealthy yet, but I knew that I'm on the way there. And that's going to be the way of like, right. hey, like, you could do it like it's possible because I'm not there yet, but I'm still doing I'm still showing up. I'm putting in the work. I'm looking at the people, you know, I'm reaching out to people. I'm learning. I'm, I'm investing in myself. I'm taking a chance. I'm taking a risk when I had every opportunity to say, hey, you know, people like me can't succeed. Right. I had yeah, every yeah. opportunity. To do so I could play, uh, you know, a, a good handful of different victim cards. But it's like I don't want to be that. I don't want that to be what dictates the outcome of my life. OK. What number two? <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't podcasting, right? Yeah. We'll have to throw real estate off the board. If you weren't yeah. podcasting, what would you be doing? So as I said, mm -hmm. I think I might've mentioned it earlier, but public speaking is where I really want to get into because like, um, as I said, I'm very social and podcasting is great, but it's like, you know, it's not too many times where I get to see you in person, where I get to connect in person, where it's like I can, you know, give a message and then like dap somebody up and like, you know, give them a hug or, or something like this. So yeah. it's, but with podcasts, I can help a lot of people. And for me, 
I feel like I have a lot of skills that would apply great on a one-to-one level, but I would much rather do that on a one-to-many level. And one of the main reasons why I decided not to really pursue real estate as, you know, as my main focus was, and let's say I'm a top realtor in my area, just because the price point is pretty high. You know, if I'm a top realtor, I'm probably selling like 30 houses. Let's say the average family size is five people, right? That's probably 150 people a year that I'm helping out. Let's say I get into public speaking or my podcast really grows. I could easily be 150,000, like easily, yeah. right? So I was like, man, I could make more of an impact doing this. I'm going to focus on this. So if I wasn't in podcasting, it would be public speaking. That's the, the where podcasting is going to eventually lead to. So uh, public speaking is what I would I'll get into. Okay, last what? And you've already alluded to this. <laughs> what advice? Would you give someone in high school? So if I take this back to my classroom, mm-hmm. I go, hey, guys, John Mendes, the guy with the great hair, <laughs> he got something to tell you. What would you tell those kids? I would say that if you work harder for the man, quote unquote, than you do <laughs> on, on, on yourself, you will never get anywhere in life. Yeah, or anywhere mm. like that. Uh, that's of meaning to impact. You might become a CEO, but like you'll probably pass away, and you probably wouldn't have impacted anyone's life, right? You might find success, but if to make actual meaning, right, you have to work on yourself. You have to become the best version of yourself possible because we're only three or four connections away from a th- from a billion people, right? So if you know a thousand people, they know a thousand people, and a lot of people my age in high school, they probably got a thousand followers, right? So you know a couple thousand people. You're only about three or four levels away from a billion people. So all this stuff that, oh, you know, I can't change the world. Like, no, you can. And by you not striving to be the best that you could potentially be, you are letting so many people down that you don't know that you probably won't ever know. But would you impact one person? I got one person that listens to my podcast. Let's say they're in in Oregon across the country from me. And let's say he, you know, gets inspired and he starts on going and he gets it booming, Right all the people that he'll help because I helped him and I probably will never meet him. Maybe one day I will. Mm. I'm speaking metaphorically, but it's like, if I wasn't doing everything I can to be the best person I can be, I'm letting the world down every day and kind of having the weight of the world on you kind of compels you to act a little bit more. Cause now it's now it's not just you it's something bigger than you. And so that's what I would say. Just strive to become the very best person, the very best version of yourself. What better place to end it? Now, of course, John, we need you to tell everybody where they can find you. Yeah. So if you are listening to this on any of the podcast directories, Walk to Wealth, that is the podcast. But if you want to get into entrepreneurship, uh, I'm going to be leaving uh, a sent Tony over a, a link to the Beginner's Guide to Entrepreneurship. Me and uh, one of the guys that hopped on my podcast uh, named Drew um, did this training where it's like the four businesses that you got to start before you start your dream business. A lot of the time we get this passion, we get this calling to start a business never having business experiences and then, then it fails and then we're like oh maybe that's what i i i wasn't supposed to be doing that maybe i was supposed to be doing something else it's like no you're supposed to be doing that you just gotta learn a couple things before you get started right so the bigger guy to entrepreneurship i'll make sure that i uh, have it in the show notes all right john thank you for coming on i mean this was <laughs> man we've been recording for, <laughs> for a, a little while, while now <laughs> a good hour and a half or so just about and I think that anybody will be able to get something from this. And that's what I strive to do with every episode is there should be something in there where people could go, oh, okay, I see what you did there. Or I can I can take something from that lesson in John's life, you know, and even if it's just about being fresh in high school, you know what I'm saying? Letting your Afro grow out. You know, if that's what somebody take and it helps them, hey, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Thank you all for listening. Uh, Make sure you uh, download, like, subscribe, share. Y'all know the routine, okay? But make sure you cop some merch. That link is also in the description. I got the hoodies. Make sure you follow me on IG. I show a bunch of stuff off there. And uh, yeah, signing off with John Mendez. I am your host, Tony Rambles, and I will see you all in the next round. Got it.